Welcome to the American Monetary Association's podcast, where we explore how monetary policy impacts the real lives of real people and the action steps necessary to preserve wealth and enhance one's lifestyle. Welcome to the American Monetary Association's podcast. This is your host, Jason Hartman, and today we're going to talk about making sense of the dollar. The author is published with Bloomberg Books, and I think you'll enjoy this show. He's pretty bullish about the dollar. I happen to be pretty bearish about the dollar, and we'll see who is right ultimately, but we'll talk about making sense of the dollar today. And on future shows, we've got a lot of great stuff coming up. We're going to talk about the looting of America. We're going to have Thomas Sewell on to talk about the housing boom and bust. He's a senior fellow with a Hoover institution, as you may know, and a great author. And we're going to talk about the dangerous reality of our fraudulent monetary system, America's Crime of the Century with director James West, all kinds of great shows coming up. But today, let's talk about making sense of the dollar. Our guest today joins us from New York City, and it is Mark Chandler. His book caught my ear as I was listening to Bloomberg because he seems to be one of the few voices out there who is actually impressed, or shall I say, a little bit bullish on the dollar. He's authored a new book called Making Sense of the Dollar, Exposing the Dangerous Myths About Trade and Foreign Exchange. And the questions we really need to think about as we're talking with Mark today is, is the dollar losing its luster as a world currency? Has the credit crisis forever tainted the U.S. dollar? Will the euro and the yuan replace the dollar as the world's reserve currency? Chandler argues convincingly that many people are wrongly pessimistic about both the dollar and the U.S. economy, and that the United States remains a vibrant and innovative country despite the severe credit crisis. Mark, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's an honor. It's great to have you on. Well, tell us a little bit about your background real quickly, if you would, and and what spurred the book and and why we should not be concerned about the value of the dollar and, and the country's economic state as well. Yeah, sure. You know, I, I can imagine it for, for many many listeners that sounds like a, some guy who's very patriotic, who, uh, you know, sort of like a uh, chest-beating uh, patriot, and uh, quite the opposite, really. You know, when the United States plays Dominican Republican baseball, I really root for the DR team. You're, you're a Sammy Sosa fan? <laughs> uh, Sammy Sosa fan, yes. And what, what happens, I think, is uh, my background, I have a master's in American history. And I studied not cl- traditional American history, but what many people would regard as a vi- revisionist school of American history. And they place a they have a, a more critical understanding of U.S. foreign policy, U.S. economic policy. And yet, using those analytic tools, I uh, I, I should say I went on to get, get a master's in, in uh, international relations as well. And using those tools for American history, I applied them to try to understand. Is America in decline? I think in many ways uh, that has been one of the key issues that come out of this crisis, but also even before the crisis. So I want to look, is the American, is America our way of life? The American commercial empire, is it on the way down? And I use these analytic tools, sort of left of center analytic tools, and I come up with what seems to be a kind of conservative conclusion. And that is that the viability of the U.S. empire is remains probably our best days may still lie ahead of us rather than looking back at sort of we peaked. I think that we have to think about power, and that's what my degree in American history helped me do. And then, of course, focusing on the markets and international relations lets me put it into a context. If I would be able to say one, one story that sort of captures this, a story about the two boys being chased by a tiger. And one of the boys stops and puts on a pair of gym shoes. And his friend says to him, you're not going to be able to outrun the tiger by just putting on gym shoes. And his friend says, I don't have to outrun the tiger. I have to outrun you. Right. And so as bad as the U.S. economy may seem, as, uh, as troubled as we are with huge debt from the government, monetization of that debt by the Federal Reserve, uh, households overstretched, we're engaged in a, uh, two wars that are unpopular. Despite all these things, I want to suggest to you that the, the source of strength, that dimensions of power, the U.S. still has, is still not rivaled by anybody. Well, I would agree with you, and I've heard that story told, and I've told it myself, with a bear rather than a lion. It is a great metaphor, and the U.S. is by far the world's largest economy, by far the world's most powerful military. As the Stratfor founder that we were talking about before we started recording has suggested, you know, America controls every sea and ocean on Earth, basically. Its reach is immense. There's no question about it. It's not just those kind of things, but it's also these non kind of things like people say to me, America has lost its innovative edge. But last year, one U.S. company got more patents than all of China. Who, who was that, I, by the way? Disclosure, full disclosure, I do not own comp- money. I do not have uh-huh. investment in this company. It's IBM. IBM, really? Okay. And so I think, well, what about, what about other things of the future, not just like military? It turns out the U.S. spends roughly twice the amount of money as, say, China does, percentage of GDP, 
on research and development. There's only like three or four countries that spend more money on research and development than the United States, and they tend to be small countries, Finland, Israel, Sweden, and Iceland. And then when you think about like higher education, what the, what's our future going to be on? Our future is not going to be on like uh, on uh, on like flipping hamburgers. Where's our future? Higher education. The U.S. spends more money on higher education than almost every other country. And even though we have problems with our primary and and secondary schools, it would seem to be largely a function of the disparity of wealth in the United States. But our higher education is is the best in the world. We get out of the all the students that go overseas to to, uh, to outside their country to get a to get a college degree, thirty percent of them come to the United States. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This is the future. No question. We we have the best universities, and we have a lot going for us. And one of the things that's a more amorphous thing that you didn't mention that I'd like to mention is we have the American brand, and we have a, a you know we have the brand of America, just its perception around the world. And it may be negative in like the foreign policy circles. You know, some people uh, say it's imperialistic and so forth. But but I'm talking about the lifestyle that most of the world really dreams of. Uh, is is really the American lifestyle to to a large extent? Yeah, I think for me, it's, it's partly it's, it's, a, it's a strong suit of ours. I agree. The American brand is a, a guy who writes for the Atlantic Monthly, James Fallows, and he was stationed in, in Japan for many years. And he was as he was leaving Japan, bringing his family back to the United States, he asked his young son, "What's he going to miss the most about Japan?" And the boy said, "McDonald's." <laughs> and I think it tells you a lot about the American brand. How uh, even the, the thing about Sony in the United States? Who really, I mean, do we really think of Sony as a Japanese company? They get a larger share of the profits in the United States than some U.S. companies. Do. Sure. Yeah. No question about it. So all of that is true, and I'll give that to you, and I agree with you. But let's talk more specifically, if we can, about the dollar itself. I mean, the government is printing money at historic rates that have never, never been even approached before in, in the history of the country. It seems to be like the Zimbabwe model almost. The debt is enormous. I mean, we've exceeded that $10 trillion number the entitlements and the obligations of the federal government add up to about $60 trillion over the coming years. This is larger than the economy of the globe, by many estimates. How, how will we pay for all of this? I mean, where will the, the resources come from to not have the dollar debased? By printing more of it. Yeah, sure. No, I, I, it, it's a very important question. I think this is uh, like the two million dollar question, as it were. I think partly, again, when when your listeners buy a stock or a bond, they know what they're buying. They're buying a claim on a future earnings stream that can be modeled. Currencies in a pure form do not have this earnings stream that can be modeled. At the same time, when you buy, you decide to sell a stock. You can buy. You can just move the money in cash. You can buy gold. You can buy uh, wheat. You can buy Chinese stocks. The problem is when you sell a currency, you've got to buy another currency. So currencies is they're sort of stuck in the foreign exchange universe. So when you sell the dollar, you got to buy another currency. And so you say, well, the U.S. has a lot of debt. It turns out that when this crisis began, the U.S. debt to GDP. Now, and the reason we look at debt numbers relative to GDP is so that so we can compare like apples and apples. So rather than dollars, because the U.S. economy is so big. So you say ten trillion dollars. It sounds like a big, a large, large amount of money. It's less than one year's of production in the United States. So when you look at these numbers at a percentage of GDP, the U.S. debt to GDP began this crisis at about 45%. Japan, and by the way, the Japanese yen today is at among its strongest levels nearly for the year. The Japanese debt to GDP ratio is close to 200%. Europe, most European countries, continental Europe countries that we think are very prudent, like Germany, uh, France, are well over 50%. Okay, so and, and, and go, circle back if you would, what is the U.S. debt to GDP ratio? The U.S. began this crisis at about 45%, and today we're at about 70%. We're not at a hundred percent, though. We're not you, you, because you said it takes a year. It's a year of production, is the way you put it. I believe. A year, yeah, a GDP in the U.S. is about fourteen and a half trillion dollars. Okay, and so we're at about eleven trillion now. About eleven trillion dollars. And the reason that that debt that debt level seems large right now is, of course, the U.S. economy is in a recession, mm-hmm. and when a recession happens tax revenues to the government fall because corporations are not making as much money. More people are unemployed, so it's less like withholding tax. And on the other side of it, the expenditure side, we spend much more money on transfer payments, such as say unemployment compensation. And so during a recession, the budget tends to be larger than otherwise. But of course, this is a very serious recession, something that most of us have not experienced in our lives. And so that means that the deficit's probably going to get bigger before we can really like uh, begin consolidating and begin like reining it in. So my concern though, Mark, is this, is that it 
seems to me we could be hit with this sort of, I'll just say double whammy for this part of it, but there are other whammies out there, such as the next wave of foreclosures and and so on and so forth, but I I won't even get into that. Just with the, the double whammy, if you will, of the graying population. So, you know, of course, we have the Gen Yers that are coming up and entering the workforce if they can get a job. (laughs) But uh, we have these baby boomers retiring who have paid into the system for four decades. And in the next two years or so, they really start to hit their entitlement age in mass. And they're going to be pulling a lot more money out of that system. And with life expectancies increasing now, granted, maybe people will work longer, which I think is certainly good because that increases production. So that's good news. But they they also demand more health care. And so many of these promises by the more and more left-leaning government over the last four decades have been made by politicians to buy votes. They're all expecting something, and the government will probably keep the promise, at least in nominal dollars, but, you know, that that burden becomes even larger. And I see what you're saying about the, the budget becoming larger during a recession to sort of get people over the hump. Absolutely accurate. I agree with you completely. So I, I guess what I'm thinking is that the demographics out of the, uh, it's again, it's a relative thing. U.S. demographics are shifting, as you suggest, but they're not nearly as bad as many other countries. And here's partly why. 1980s and 1990s, the U.S. imported, as it were, a million immigrants a year, more than the rest of the world combined, leaving aside the political refugees, just immigrants, people who want to come to your country and work and have a life. A million immigrants a year for 20 years. So what this means then is that, give you an example, is that Japan has a shrinking population. Ukraine and Russia are on the verge of a shrinking population. Italy is not that far behind. In the U.S., if you like fast forward, say, to 2030, Europe is going to have roughly twice as many people above 65 as children below 15. Wow. The the demographics are just shifting so quickly. I mean, the West has stopped having babies pretty much. Well, I think what keeps the U.S. population growing is not so much the native-born population, it's but immigration. the immigrants. Sure. And so we look at the fertility rates, China, Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan, they're already below the replacement level, which is the level of births per woman. Mm-hmm. Right? We are looking at, um, so I think that if we fast forward, the demographic situation is serious here, but it's much worse in other countries. And the other point would be that we have a, still a relatively low population density. Mm-hmm. That is, we could take in a lot more immigrants, and our culture is open to it. In a way, even though from time to time there's a backlash against it, people like Pat Buchanan want to build a big fence around the country and keep it white and Christian. But I think that in the big picture of things, the immigrants in the U.S. is part of the dynamic of the United States. And because we have a tradition, say, unlike Japan, shrinking population, but no real willingness to have immigrants. So I think that the cultural values, the American brand of a melting pot, is still a strong suit for the U.S. And because we have generally a somewhat younger population than other countries, countries, the demographic issue, we'll be able to uh, sort of work our way through easier. Not like it's going to be a piece of cake and not like, you're right, there's some real problems. I want to make sure my mother still gets Social Security. I want to make sure I still get Social Security. I want to make sure that we have health care for Americans. But I think that as problematic as these are, we have a type of economy and country that's easier. So if I had a bet, which country can address the demographic issues easier? My money would be on the United States. Well, I would agree with you until... I say, let's pick apart those demographics. So does the influx of immigrants has changed? I mean, this is largely, and please, listeners, don't give me some rap about being critical or anything like that. I'm just stating the fact of what it is. It's largely Hispanic populations, and it's largely less educated people. Some would argue are not assimilating enough. Some are, some aren't, of course, it depends. But what do you say to that? I mean, these are not like high-income, highly educated people for the most part. Right. And I think that's part of the beautiful thing about how immigration in the U.S. works. My family came over in the 1880s, and they still spoke the old language. Uh, My family came from uh, Poland and Lithuania. They were still speaking the old language. And it took a generation, two generations for them to fit in. Remember, you can go to many urban centers in the U.S. still and find different ethnic neighborhoods. And so I think that this is largely a issue of uh, of sort of uh, like digestion, a surge of immigrants. And now we're trying to digest it in a time when we've got rising unemployment and greater anxiety that the, you know, that now we've got after the Berlin Wall fell and after China embraced capitalism, you've got now the uh, work in the United States not just competes with Western Europeans and Canadians and Japanese, but now they've got to compete with 1.1 billion Chinese, another billion Indians, and uh, 
hundreds of millions of Eastern and Central Europeans. So I think that that anxiety makes us a little bit more centered to the immigrant issue. But I think that that still becomes a source of strength for the U.S., even though it might not feel like it in the short run. In the long run, this is a source of dynamism to the United States. Yeah, and, and I agree. You know, the U.S. has always been very open. You know, it's really part of the American business model to accepting immigrants, and that does keep the population younger, and it, it, it keeps it from becoming a Japan or a Russia, which is, I mean, Japan is 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 dying just because of the, the shrinking fertility, and then Russia shrinking fertility, but also huge alcohol problems and so forth. The thing I'd like to ask you, though, also about the immigration issue is it seems like the, the analogy you gave about outrunning the lion by putting on the tennis shoes, right? You know, just you just have to outrun the other person. So if America just outruns the other countries, you're right. America in relation is doing better. Okay, true. But the problem is, is that it's not a closed system as it was when we didn't have this globalization and and very open trade. Now the system is very open. So it's sort of like we all need to win. The whole world economy needs to be winning kind of together. It's not like, we can let our other country get eaten by the lion, you know. We we, we got to all win. We've got to all be pulled up. Well, yeah, I think so. I, I agree with you that it's a, because it's a much more tightly wound world, we're sort of bound in it together. But I think this is where it comes down to the role of the dollar and the role of the U.S. economy. If the dollar is not, I think that in order, to, as a precondition, in order to get a replace, in order to get the dollar to decline, to so lose its role in the, in the, in the world economy, because remember, think about the, what, the, what the role of the dollar is in the world economy. Two-thirds of the world's central Two-thirds of the world's reserves are kept in U.S. dollars. That roughly has not changed since 1990. It fluctuates year to year, quarter to quarter, but generally speaking, it's about 65%. The dollar is also, you name the commodity, from energy to food to fibers, traded, priced in U.S. dollars. Something like 50% of Italy's exports are not invoiced in euros, but invoiced in dollars. When Australia sells iron ore to China, China's got to pay U.S. dollars. So it's another rule of the dollar. And so uh, I think also, think about this, the stink test or the smell test, as it were. Sometimes I travel for business. I go to, a, I'm in a foreign city. I land at the airport, and sometimes I don't have enough of the local currency to get me into my hotel and see my client. So I ask the cab driver if he'll take U.S. dollars. I have never been turned down. I do not have the uh, intestinal fortitude to ask the taxi driver if he would take Chinese renminbi. But I would imagine they would laugh me out of the cab. Right. Yeah, that's that's a good point. No, and, and I've I've traveled all over the world too, and and the dollar is pretty welcome. Uh, most so, so in order for the dollar to demise, we need to have an alternative for it. And so look what's happened. China. I don't know if you've seen this. There's a lot of talk going around the market that maybe China is going to uh, is encouraging some of its state-owned enterprises to renegotiate contracts. They decide to buy, say, corn three months ago. But now the price of corn's fallen. Say it's fallen from $3 a bushel to $2 a bushel. Why should the Chinese businessman pay $3 a bushel when we all know it's only worth two now? And so the, the contract law, the uh, transparency of uh, the, the financial system, the transparency of the legal system. You know, remember what happened? China's negotiating with uh, uh, an iron ore company and then arrest the chief negotiating team because they say they're spying. And so China's going to replace us? I don't see that. What about Europe? People said to me in 1999 when the euro was born, people said to me, ah, the euro, now that there's an alternative to the U.S. dollar, the euro is going to, re- everybody's going to just flock to the euro. Today, the euro is not much bigger than the sum of its parts. That is, before the euro existed, there was a European currency unit, which is a basket currency called the ECU, ECU. And then the Deutsche Mark and French franc. Those three together made up about 25% of the world's reserves. The euro today? Roughly 25% of the world's reserves. So I, for me, the first thing I would need to think that the, dollar is, the dollar's rule in the world is going to change, say, okay, maybe it will. What's going to be the alternative? And I just don't see a clear, compelling alternative now. I think of it like our keyboards, the QWERT. It's kind of silly, right? Why can't they just put them in alphabetical order? If I told you I came up with yeah. a, right, a new keyboard, right, you're right, first mover advantage, but, so the next mover has to not just be marginally better in order for me to change it. It's got to be a whole lot better. So I think that right now in the world that uh, there's no real alternative to the transparency and depth of the U.S. Treasury market. There's no real compelling alternative to the U.S. dollar. And so without, I think that the two conditions then to, for the dollar to really lose its role is a clear alternative and for the U.S. to lose its will. And I think that, as, I think that uh, we might have our differences of opinion about uh, President Obama, but I do not think he wants to give up the U.S. empire. I think he wants to help manage it more efficiently. 
I don't know, maybe even arguably more responsibly, but he doesn't want to give it up. The U.S. isn't abdicating. People in Florida might have confused uh, George Bush with Pat Buchanan, but I don't think the country has. We're not about to give up and build a big fence around the country. Nothing comes in, nothing goes out. Okay, so let me just address a couple of those things, and I told you I was going to kind of challenge you a little bit here, sure. okay? So uh, the reserve currency issue. There's a lot of noise being made by other countries. You know, Brazil and Russia are trading outside of the dollar. Giselle, the famous supermodel, wants to be paid in euros, you know, that's sort of fun. no big deal, but it just kind of makes a statement. Taj Mahal last year said they won't accept dollars. And there's some places here in New York on the east side, different than the west side, if anybody watches Seinfeld, but the east, some, some stores on the east side are willing to take euros. But I want to tell you that this is when politicians and other, we know when our politicians are lying. We know when U.S. politicians are lying because their lips move. But somehow, when a Russian politician or a Chinese politician says something, we take them at face value. I want to suggest to you that rather than following what, I mean, the, 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 the political economist way of saying it would be drawing a distinction between declaratory policy and operational policy. Declaratory policy is what people say. Operational policy is what they do. And here's what the Chinese, who really are leading this charge about jumping the dollar, in verbal, the, the declaratory policy. But operationally, second half of last year, China increased its treasury holdings by more than a third. January, February, and March of this year, they were also buyers of U.S. treasuries. April, they turned into small net sellers, but they came back to the buy side in May and June. So I would say this, that Central banks talk about it, but I would say that the content of it is much more about politics than it is about economics. And bottom line here is that there's not really, on a, on a, uh, on a big picture view, there's no real sign of foreign central banks selling U.S. treasury, actually selling the U.S. dollar, selling treasuries, uh, reducing their holdings. If anything, central banks have accumulated roughly another three or $400 billion worth of treasuries this year. Okay, so the one argument with that would be, though, that they are still buying, but they're buying less than before. And also, some speculate, and this is on a little bit more of the conspiratorial side, that they're being sort of forced to buy through behind-the-scenes political maneuvering and so forth. I don't know about that, but I just wanted yeah, to... No, yeah, no, it's true that the... Uh, it's true that the uh, partly, why are, why are central banks buying treasuries? Why are they building up reserves? Partly, they're cycl- recycling their trade surpluses. So they take their trade surplus, they say, we don't want to get this to affect the economy, so we'll take those dollars we get for selling our goods to the, to the uh, hungry Americans, and we'll take those dollars, we'll put them in our reserves. Because of this crisis, trade surpluses have diminished. But not only has the world's trade surpluses diminished, like South Korea and uh, Brazil's and Australia's, but the U.S. trade deficit itself has shrunk. So just at that moment in time where our current account deficit is smaller, other countries have, small, have smaller trade surpluses, so there's somewhat less money to circulate. But I would say that this year, what surprised a lot of people is that despite the huge amount of supply coming in from our treasury, despite the huge supply coming in from corporate America, who's issuing bonds, the U.S. Treasury yields are, st- we're talking about a 10-year yield at 3.2 per- 3.28% today. So it's up about 100 basis points this year, partly because at the very end of last year, it looked like the Titanic hit the iceberg. The world economy was sinking, sinking fast. And so U.S. interest rates fell very low. That discouraged people from buying long-term bonds. And so instead, the central banks and other people bought short-term instruments. Now that the bond market has has risen again, 100 basis points year to date, but still at 3.2%, we're still very low. You look at a country like Germany, more people think a more prudent country, they're not monetizing the debt nearly as fast as we are, in smaller deficits. Their 10-year bond yield is 3.22%. There's a six basis point difference between us and Germany. The, one of the more prudent people perceive as one of the more prudent countries. I don't see signs that foreigners have stopped buying treasuries. I don't see a sign yet that the supply has really weakened the dollar. In fact, when I look at things, I'd say that the dollar is st- much stronger than it was a year ago. And I can put that. I can put this in perspective for you. But but a year ago was a disaster. A year ago, this month or next month, really. You know, so um, I don't know. How's it compared to two years ago? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it depends. Yeah, you can pick. You can pick different starting points. So I would say that it's not. It's not clear to me that if we if we want to argue that the the policies that Ob- that the last couple of years of the Bush administration pursuing, what Obama has uh, furthered and extended. I mean, Bush gave us a first stimulus package. Obama's given us a second one now, and uh, maybe a third one's coming. Maybe a third. One. I kind of I suspect there's a third one, but in piecemeal, uh, like the, the cash for clunkers, the minimum wage hike, there's a third one, but they can't call it a package to get through Congress. But I would say that during this time, we have not seen the kind of decline during this period of rapid growth of the budget deficit, rapid monetization of debt. We have not seen a large decline in the dollar.
We could see one. It could be in the future. But then it's like, what don't we know now that we'll know then that's going to drive, that's going to change people's attitudes? I just don't see the, uh, I see the inflationary risk, but I think that in the near term, the bigger risk than inflation is the opposite of inflation, which is deflation. I'll give you an example. We have this thing that the, uh, both the Federal Reserve and the ECB, the European Central Bank, have cited as a gauge of inflation expectations. What they want to do is they, they don't really care where inflation is in the very short run because that's going to be influenced by the price of oil and commodities. What they want to do is take a look at not inflation, say, to the next five years, 2010 to 2015. They want to take a look at inflation expectations 2015 to 2020. They think that is where the real signal is of inflation expectations. And here's what it looks like in the United States. It's called a five-year, five-year forward, which is inflation expectations. Right now, it's 2.26%. In the U.S., in France, which is a proxy for Europe or the eurozone, because Germany doesn't have a very liquid liquid instruments here, France is 2.84 percent, roughly 50 basis points on top of us. The U.K. is at 330, more than 100 basis points more expected inflation there than at home. So I just don't see the inflation threat being peaked up by the market. The market knows that Obama's printing, Obama's issuing a lot of debt, and Bernanke's providing the reserves to buy it. Right. We got to do a little bit shorter answers just in the interest of time because I have so many questions for you. First thing I want to say is back to the reserve currency issue. That G20 meeting that was held, what, what about two months in ago, April. what was going on there? You know, it's so secretive and so forth. I, I mean, there's rumors of talk of a new currency. You were saying, what else is there that's going to be the better QWERTY keyboard, you know, better than the dollar, right? And right. so can you address that just real briefly, that G20 meeting? Yeah, sure. China, uh, China's central banker had a page on their website, which is freely available. It's in English, uh, People's Bank of China. And uh, he proposed that maybe we use these SDRs, special drawing rights, as sort of a money type thing created by the IMF. No official that I've spoken with thinks it's really a starter. It's primarily a way, a way that China can tell the U.S. to bugger off. That is, to every other meeting that there was before this G20 meeting, the U.S. would tell China, get your currency to appreciate. China was getting tired of being picked on, and so China retaliated. And as we know from sports, the best type of, uh, one of the best forms of uh, defense is to go on offense. And that's what China did. Ahead of the G20 meeting coming up, China is not saying a word about it, and we're not saying a word about their currency. There's been like a, 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 a agreement to disagree, and we both have sort of backed off from teasing each other, from, from uh, sort of trying to egg each other on. And China has been accused, by the way, of artificially devaluing its currency to increase its exports. Yes, the Chinese currency under Bretton Woods, the fixed exchange rate regime, currencies were allowed to move in a 1% band, and that was regarded as fixed exchange rate. I mean, since the beginning of this year, China's currency has moved in less than a three quarters of a percent range. It's fixed back to the dollar. And then your prior thought that you were just giving uh, a moment ago, one of the things that whole argument presupposes, though, is that the U.S. has accurate expectations of inflation with that index that you were talking about. You know, uh, may, yep. may, maybe the U.S. is manipulating more. I mean, you know, certainly no one would disagree that the CPI is manipulated and so forth to whatever side you want to think it is, but no one says it's perfectly accurate by any means, or the core rate. And then why would the expectation numbers be accurate either? Maybe other countries have more accurate expectation stats and the U.S. has less accurate yeah, that's, stats. Yeah, that's fascinating. Cause I, I, really, I really like that. I mean, you see that game show, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? Mm -hmm, sure. It turns out that the audience is right 95% of the time when they're asked. And so that's one of the beautiful things about the market is that it aggregates all of our individual knowledge. As individuals, we might be silly, stupid, uninformed, but as a group, we're very smart. And it turns out that these kinds of, that's why the Federal Reserve and the ECB often cite market-driven prices or instruments as a reflections of inflation expectations because you get an aggregate. People who are willing to put their money where their mouths are, they, they vote with the pocketbook, in effect. And so these, these indexes that I mentioned, the five-year, five-year forward, is determined by people buying and selling things all day long. That's why not only the audience is right 95% of the time, but that's why opinion polls, like polls of who's going to win for president of the United States, tend to be more accurate than many of the individual forecasters. So I'd say that these, that it's not perfect. There's, there's a number of different ways to get inflation expectations. Market instruments seem to be what central banks are looking at. Okay. So please explain to the audience, if you would, if there is any difference between the value of the dollar, whether it be moving up or down, and inflation and deflation. Are those, are those separate issues or are they the same thing? Let me put it this way. Inflation, as the way economists understand it, would be an increase in the general price level. If you say the price of gasoline goes up, is that inflationary? I say, well, the more money you have to spend on gasoline, the less money you have to take the family out for a restaurant. So what we're really talking about there is a relative price change. The price of gasoline goes up, other prices fall because of lack of demand or stay the same. Inflation is an increase in general prices. Deflation is a general fall in prices. 
So what happens then is what causes inflation? Some people think, uh, Milton Friedman, that inflation is a monetary phenomenon, that the central bank prints off more money than the goods are being created, more money chasing few goods. So what happens, how does the dollar fit in here? Oftentimes when the dollar falls, the argument goes, the dollar declines, and the price of imports, and you know America, they're really hooked on imports. As the dollar falls, the imports that we buy, the price goes up. So say the dollar falls uh, against the Japanese yen, and now the price of our, of our maybe a uh, stereo system goes up. And then that, that allows domestic producers to raise their prices, and now you've got a general price increase. Some interesting things about why, that, why it typically does not happen like that in the United States. A good comes into the United States, say uh, to the uh, New, New Jersey port or California port. The price of that import, then, that, that good that comes in, now has to be uh, stored, it has to be marketed, and it has to be distributed. Those costs, storage, marketing, distribution, adds on 30 to 50% of the price of a good. And those, those prices, the storage, the marketing, the distribution, are dollar denominated. So typically, we'd call it pass-through. That is, how much of the currency shock, currency adjustment, is passed through the consumer? It's interesting because countries, capitalism is not monolithic. Countries, say, in Europe and Japan, for example, they have access, they rely much more on bank capital. The bank capital is patient. So when they compete, they're more likely to, to eat the currency shift and try to preserve market share because that's their long-term way of staying in the business. American businesses, British businesses, when we're hit with an exchange rate shock, we have access not so much to patient capital, but the impatient capital of the market. So for companies in the U.S. and the U.K. who get hit with an exchange rate shock, they have to pass it on to the customer. They compete by preserving profit margin. European and Japanese companies compete by preserving market share. Two different ways of competing, and their way, that is European and Japanese way of competing, helps prevent a weak dollar from fueling inflation. Okay, so what you're really saying there is that the value of the widget coming into the port is only a small, well, it's not a small portion, but it's certainly not everything in terms of what happens, because what happens after it gets here is all dollar denominated, and that really determines a lot about prices and inflation or deflation. Is that correct? Right. Yep. Okay. And the other point I'd make is that almost 95% of what the U.S. imports is already invoiced in dollars. People don't charge us Chinese and NIMBY when we buy Chinese imports. We don't pay Brazilian reais well, when we, pay we dollars. buy some yeah. from Brazil. We pay dollars. So, so that the, and these prices, uh, when businesses make prices, they usually are locked in for a period of time, six months, 12 months. It's, it's not something that changes. The currency market is volatile. It moves around quite a bit. But prices of our goods don't adjust as quickly as the price of money. Yeah, well, certainly I agree with that. Now, it's sort of interesting to note, and I'm sure you've studied the Zimbabwe disaster. I remember reading uh, just several months Months ago that they were arresting shopkeepers. What happened is prices were rising so fast due to their printing press. They told the shopkeepers that they could not raise prices. If they did raise prices, they would be arrested. And so shopkeepers just decided, hey, look, you know, if I can't raise my prices, the currency is devaluing so quickly. If I can't raise my prices, I can't stay in business. So they just stopped selling goods and then it led to shortages. So <laughs> it's interesting, you know, when you talk about Milton Friedman and how he and the Chicago School believe you know, inflation everywhere, and it all always is a monetary phenomenon. Harry Dent and Mark Chandler yourself would, would differ with that. I'm having a hard time getting my head around that it's not a monetary phenomenon. I know there are other factors, but it just seems if you have more dollars chasing a limited supply of goods and services, you're going to see price increases ultimately. It takes time, doesn't work its way through the system instantly. I've heard everything you say, but, you know, i got to let this sit with me for a while. Great. I, I think that, like, a lot of people are concerned. I'd say for most people, I think about, like, Warren Buffett's piece in the New York Times a few weeks ago. I think he called it the greenback emissions. Mm -hmm. And his argument wasn't so much about current inflation, but the prospect of future inflation. I think that's what really scares a lot. Almost, I want to say, most of the institutional money managers I know, many of the high net worth individuals I know, they're concerned about inflation. Not today, not tomorrow, maybe even not next year. They, they, so I think they are very sympathetic to your, your point. And I, and I would say that, from my point of view, I'd say that it's a possibility uh, rather than a certainty. And I think that it becomes a, uh, I want to say that the, the, so the, the book has not been written yet. That is, the, our fate is in our own hands. What's happened is the Federal Reserve has printed, in effect, a lot of money. But that money, the bulk of it has stayed at the Federal Reserve. The banks, basically what happens when the Federal Reserve buys a bond from the, from the, from the market, rather than like uh, just printing off money, they credit the banks in their reserve account. And the banks leave that money with their account at the Federal Reserve, the bulk of the money, hundreds of billions of dollars now. 
And so the issue is, will this money, which is where people think the fuel is going to come for inflation, will this money leak out of the Federal Reserve and chase goods or financial assets? And right now, the problem is that we can't get them, we can't get the banks to, to, to loan the money. Well, you're you're, the you're right about that, but that, that's the whole point of the Obama spending. Obama's pitch is, look, I'm going to spend money, and you know, granted he's going to do it on cash for clunkers, infrastructure, energy efficiency, all of the big goals that I hope work out. But money will be put into the economy under an Obama administration. It will be in people's hands. Yes, it's true, but it's, it's making up for the loss of, I'd say that money is making up for the loss elsewhere. It's not like new money coming to the system. A lot of money has been destroyed by the fallen house prices, by the decline in equity markets, even though the stock market's up this year, we're having a good year, yes, but still well off of its highs. So the Federal Reserve, it's an effect what happens is we dug a deep hole. The Federal Reserve comes along and puts some dirt in that hole, but still not level. Right. It's, it's only it's only half, half refilled or three quarters refilled. I agree with you. Yes. Yeah, so, so it's not inflationary yet. Yeah, so could it be that down the road it becomes inflationary? And it, it might be. And I think this is partly the battle that, uh, say, Neil Ferguson has with uh, Paul Krugman. Right. Paul Krugman says it's not, gonna, it's not necessarily going to be inflationary. And I think uh, Neil Ferguson takes your, your point of view. Right. And I think that in some ways the debate is between the monetarists and the Keynesians. Mm -hmm. In some ways, you know, when it comes to natural sciences, we, we progress. We know we have atomic theory now rather than phlogiston, this thing that fire was supposed to be made of. We know how many planets there are in the solar system. We know how light works. The problem is in the, in, the, in the social sciences, we don't seem to get very far. Many of the debates that we're having now are just a rehash of the debates that took place in the early part of the 20th century uh, with Keynes and some of his critics. And we haven't really progressed very far. But I do think that when push comes to shove, that both probably are right and that we can find a... Uh, it, doesn't, we, it could be inflationary, but it doesn't have to be. That is policy. We individuals, what we do matters. Okay, so I, I agree with you there. Just a simple answer, I, because I want to make sure the listeners really caught what you said there. It was rather convoluted, and I know you have to back it up with a lot of things. Does a devaluation of the dollar mean inflation, or is it separate? You can have a devaluation of the dollar and not be inflationary like we've had right now. Okay. You can have a weak currency and have, have low inflation. You can have a strong currency and have low inflation. Telling me that currency, guessing inflation, is like telling me you have blue eyes, guess how tall you are. And uh, would you classify yourself as a Keynesian? Uh, I don't know. I, I, I think understanding economics is so difficult. Uh -huh. I, I think of myself much more as eclectic and pragmatic. Okay. I, I see what works and I do that. What do you think in, in kind of wrapping this up and, and bringing it all home? What does the future of our economy look like over the next year, the next two years, the next three years? Uh, I mean, is this recession going to get worse? Uh, what, what can we expect? Well, I'd say in the short run, that is a, uh, this quarter that we're currently in, the third quarter that's winding down, fourth quarter, and probably the first two quarters of next year seem to me to be probably fairly good. If anything, the market is probably underestimating the growth here in the second half of this year. However, what we, I think, as Americans have to get used to is we can't, we're probably not going to go back to sustained, on a trend basis, 3% plus growth. We probably have to lower our expectations. I think that, for me, one of the big problems is that if possible, perhaps even likely, that our children do not live, our, our children and our grandchildren don't live as good as we do. I'll give you an example. The World Health Organization says all we need is about 25 gallons of water a day per person. Now, the average North American, that's U.S. and Canada, goes to about 150 gallons of water a day. That does not seem to me to be sustainable, especially as more of the world modernizes. So I, I do think there's some problems, but I think that in the future, what we should do is look for more growth short term, low inflation short run, longer term, slower growth. And inflation is not going to stay at these kind of low levels, but core inflation probably stays between 1% and 2%. Okay, so 1% and 2% core inflation, which means the CPI is going to read, what, about 4%? CPI could, CPI could go up, up a headline CPI partly because that headline CPI picks up a lot of oil and oil prices, as you know, well off the highs from last July. But on a, sort of as we look at year over year, and, uh, as we get further into the year, we're going to get a big rise in headline inflation just because oil prices are no longer at $160 a barrel. And, and just for the, the listeners, I want to distinguish, of course, we've reviewed this on the show before, but core inflation means the CPI excluding food and energy because it's theoretically too volatile, although... I don't know anybody who can live without food and energy. <laughs> so I think you're right. It's sort of like sort of like a radio. Right. The radio can produce. Um Sometimes when you listen to a music station, it produces music and it sometimes produces noise. And sometimes people can differ. I think my uh, parents did not think that Elvis Presley was music. Now we know better. So reasonably people can differ on what's music and what's the noise. And the Federal Reserve argues that 
core inflation is the signal. That's the music. The other stuff is noise. And what we want to do is keep an eye on the signal. Not that the whole thing, but that it is, it is the truer signal of where price pressures are coming. Yeah, right. Fair enough. I, I just know that when I go to the grocery store or the gas station next time, I'm going to tell them I want to pay the core rate. <laughs> pay the core rate. <laughs> I'm being yes. sarcastic there. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so th- that's kind of your forecast for the economy. And Mark, just kind of wrapping this up, any, any thoughts for the listeners and, and where can they buy the book? Sure. The book came out middle of August and it's, uh, it's not, I, I should say something about the book. It's really, it looks at 10 different myths about the about foreign exchange and trade and it, I think it complicates the situation and these are like well grounded myths that people have believed for a long time. Uh, I think it's a, a bit thinking outside the box. The book is, uh, no. a lot of people are concerned about economists and all these mathematic formulas and charts and equations and there's nothing like that in the book. There's some pictures and charts but it's not mathematical equations. It's a narrative. I explain things I, in a non-jargon way. The book is available. Bloomberg published a book. The book is available at Bloomberg. It's available on Amazon. I would like if people do read the book and even if they don't necessarily like it, Bloomberg uh, tells me that having reviews on Amazon it helps uh, even if people don't agree with the book. And I wouldn't expect people do. As long as they think it's a thoughtful, provo- provocative book, I think I've done my job. I also have a blog that people can follow my analysis. Uh, it's called uh, Mark to Market. Mark with a C. Mark to Market.com. Oh, okay. So that's a play on your name. <laughs> Mark to Market. That's excellent. Okay, good. Well, Mark Chandler, thank you so much for joining us. The book is Making Sense of the Dollar, Exposing the Dangerous Myths about Trade and Foreign Exchange. We appreciate your insights today. Thank you very much. The American Monetary Association is a nonprofit venture funded by the Jason Hartman Foundation, which is dedicated to educating people about the practical effects of monetary policy and government actions on inflation, deflation, and personal freedom. Our goal is to help people prosper in the midst of uncertain economic times. This show is produced by the Jason Hartman Foundation, all rights reserved. For publication rights and media interviews, please visit www.hartmanmedia.com or email media at hartmanmedia.com. Nothing on this show should be considered specific personal or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate professional if you require individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own and the host is acting on behalf of the Jason Hartman Foundation exclusively.